about the creation of uh, the planet uh, and of the human species, but it is an assertion that has no experimental evidence. Evolutionary theory wins because it has produced a large body of evidence. How about Dr. Beck and Dr. Freud? Well, look, if you pile up the whole stack of uh, evidence uh, on uh, psychodynamic theory uh, next to the body of evidence on cognitive behavior therapy, even though uh, you know, Beck's model of cognitive therapy has been around for a very short period of time relative to Freud, you know, the cognitive therapy data, the experiments run, would stack up like this high. And, you know, the psychodynamic, you know, stack of experiments would, you know, you'd have to get a microscope to see it. I mean, there is some data out there, but that theory, Freud's theory, which I think has lots of truth in it, actually, some aspects of it have lots of truth in it. The problem is, as a theory, it has never, never generated an extensive body of experimental evidence. Beck's theory is a good theory. And I'm not saying it's a good theory because it's a true theory. I'm saying it's a good theory because it's easy to see how to do experiments on Beck's theory. That's what defines a good scientific theory. Can you do experiments? Does it generate a large body of experimental evidence? By the way, I think Beck is wrong. His theory is wrong. Now, sometimes when people hear me, they hear me say, Beck is wrong, but I'm right. I'm not saying that. Beck is wrong, and I am wrong. All scientific theories are wrong. Right? Copernicus was wrong. Galileo was wrong. Newton was wrong. Einstein was wrong. Unless we have the first theory ever, you know, that is true and right for all time, our theory is wrong. The difference between old theories and new theories is not that the old theories are false and the new theories are true. It's that if they're good theories, we can subject them to experimental analysis and find out not whether they're wrong, but how they are wrong. So the goodness and the reason I like Paul's work a lot although he does not seem to share that sentiment with my own work. <laughs> I like Paul's work a lot. And I, as I said, I think that we would be much ahead in understanding human psychological suffering if it were like Paul and I duking it out, because aside from uh, intrusions into my talk, we would end up having to put up or shut up. We would have to, like, generate the evidence, you know, he doesn't get to say relational theory, uh, frame theory you know, is a bad theory because I can't understand it. I mean, he can say it if he wants to, but it won't have very much uh, impact on the doing of that experimental research. If he wants to show that it's false, he has to generate an alternative theory that produces a large body of evidence that explains everything relational frame theory explains, uh, perhaps in simpler terms, uh, and answer some questions that that theory won't answer. That's, that, uh, that experimental ground is the place where we find out the goodness of theories. If, if, unlike Freud's work, they can generate experiments. Now, which way is the wind blowing? You will not find me in tremendous agreement with uh, Paul in this regard, and that's fine because the assertions that he made and the ones that I make are testable assertions, right? Did I mention that I'm wrong? Yeah, I'm wrong. Hey, Kelly, you're wrong. I, thank you. I'm wrong. I don't know exactly how yet, but that I'm wrong is a foregone conclusion. Did you write that down, Paul? Because I think that that will be handy in some future talk. <laughs> here are two, here are two, we're not in questions yet. Uh, here are two um, hypotheses, and they're really, really good scientific hypotheses. These are good scientific hypotheses, and the reason 
that I say these are good scientific hypotheses is because it's easy to do experiments and test uh, uh, whether the data comport with the hypotheses. So what are they? There are two major hypotheses that have driven um, our uh, treatment of psychological uh, difficulties over the last um, some 30 or 40 years, some going back um, as far as 75 or 80 years in the case of the fear hypothesis. And uh, Paul, I think, quite rightly pointed out that the fear hypothesis has uh, some serious problems from multiple fronts. That's experimental evidence that shows that it does. Now, there are some problems right now with the support of that core cognitive hypothesis. The hypothesis is that these problem thoughts uh, cause psychological difficulties, and the remediation is if you can change uh, these problematic thoughts into more adaptive thoughts, then you'll see remission in the kinds of difficulties. That's the core cognitive hypothesis, I would argue. There are variations on this because, of course, there's not just one cognitive theory. There's not just one cognitive behavioral theory. There's not just one behavioral theory. There are many theories competing experimentally, one hopes. So just a look at goodness. I apologize. I uh, goofed up the rendering. Okay. Sorry. Let me just say a few words about the basic model that I'm interested in. And then I'll come back to this issue of how do we know if it's a good model or a poor model, and I don't mean true or false. All right. Um, we think that human psychological difficulties, and I applaud Paul's interest in integrative theory. We cannot sustain, you know, the billion theories of the billion psychological disorders. We need theories that have uh, extraordinary breadth so that you can take one theory into the room, one set of principles into the room, and treat a wide variety of different uh, difficulties uh, uh, using those principles. These are uh, some that we think are important, and uh, some people will recognize the psychological flexibility uh, model here. Um, here's a kind of a variation on that theme that's in uh, a, a reasonably, I think, common sense uh, terms. So how do you get, uh, in, how do human beings get in trouble in terms of psychological suffering? Well, they lose contact with the present moment, and there are lots of forms that this takes. Sometimes the form that it takes is uh, rumination, and a person being sort of endlessly lost in these kind of loops um, uh, about the past. Sometimes it takes the form of worry, and so people get lost in these kind of endless loops, the sort of uh, getting stuck that uh, Paul uh, uh, well described, right? And while they're busy being stuck in you know, future catastrophes and past catastrophes, they miss their lives. You know, their lives get away from them. Another dimension here, this acceptance dimension, how do people get in trouble? Well, they run away from hard thoughts and emotions. And they run away from the situations that precipitate those. And it produces short-term benefits for people. So, for example, if you break my heart, then uh, I, I, I withdraw. And it's the most natural thing in the world for me to kind of curl in on myself. So now I'm trying to move around in the world, and I meet you, and I think, Oh, well, she's nice, and we start to talk, and then I start to think, something could come of this. This could develop. But wait, what if that happens again? And then you ask me, would you like to go to dinner? And I say, well, I'm sorry, but I really got to work. I've got this report I have to get out. And I pull back. And the longer I pull back, uh, the more stuck I get in that. Some avoidance is good stuff. You know, I recommend that you avoid lions, tigers, bears, poisonous snakes. But some kinds of avoidance 
just close our lives down and we end up in these kind of endless loops of uh, avoidance and fear and avoidance and fear and avoidance and fear. The things that promise to help us are very often the very things that burrow us down in there. You could hear exactly some of those uh, kinds of things described in Paul's talk. As I said, there was much that he said that I agreed with. In fact, uh, this idea that people are doing things to reduce fear is false. We know there are situations where people are doing things in response to fear that actually increase fear. We get entangled with categorical and judgmental thought. I think this was Beck's central and, I think, brilliant uh, notion, is that Beck saw in his clinical work that people were not just uh, stuck in the circumstances of their lives. They were stuck in these kind of storied up uh, versions of their lives, these sort of storied up kind of traps that they uh, inhabited. And a very reasonable hypothesis is they're bad stories. They're maladaptive stories, and we should change the content of the stories. That's a very sensible and, I would add, very testable hypothesis. Right? We take a different approach. And our approach uh, to uh, uh, what to do with difficult cognition uh, is uh, to hold it gently, so to speak, metaphorically, and in a way that I never really had a difficult time helping clients to understand. Have you ever seen a piece of cactus? I've got a friend, Hank Robb, who has a small piece of cactus in his office. And he'll ask his clients uh, to hold out their hands, cupped like this. And he'll gently set this piece of cactus in their hands. And he'll say, does that hurt? And they say, no, it doesn't hurt. What if you held it like this? It would hurt a lot. And so there are some metaphorical ways that we can help people to understand that maybe it's not the cactus itself, but the way that they're holding that cactus uh, that causes difficulty. Now, we're not alone in that notion. And there are people like Adrian Wells who think likewise, but from a cognitive perspective. We think things like mindfulness technologies um, are really focused very much on helping people to learn the skill of holding the thoughts that emerge uh, uh, lightly, to hold them gently. That you can have these thoughts without doing what the thoughts tell you. And we've developed technologies uh, to help people make contact with that and to help people uh, practice that and to learn it. Down here is kind of a sub set of that, which is um, buying into stories about you know, who and what we are and what is possible for us. And our uh, uh, work in that area, similarly, does not try to refute or dispute people's negative thoughts about themselves, but instead uh, to try to teach them to hold uh, these negative thoughts about themselves in kindness. It's a simple, uh, a simple sort of thing. One of the key tools in this area, and an important one, is the building of flexible perspective taking. People's ability to see their own lives uh, from different perspectives, their ability uh, to see uh, from the perspective of another, um, uh, allows them to move more flexibly in their own uh, lives. Some difficulties that we see in psychological uh, uh, areas um, have involved more substantial uh, struggles in you know, some of these different areas and combinations of these different areas. This um, area in building flexible perspective taking, uh, as an example, does not apply just to um, things like anxiety and depression, but also difficulties like Asperger's. So there are people in uh, Asperger's and autism spectrum that are teaching children who have these difficulties with perspective taking, directly teaching uh, that perspective taking. Um, and what they're finding is uh, changes in social functioning and, and, and changes in 
uh, learning functioning as the result of learning this flexible perspective taking. Changing interactions with like their parents, and their teachers, and their peers. Another way that humans get stuck, you get stuck seeing from only one perspective. You get stuck buying these stories that you tell yourself about the world and holding on to them. People also get stuck uh, by losing contact with the things that are really meaningful and important to them. This is, there's certainly lots of true stuff about this in the literary traditions and in the spiritual traditions, but do we have a robust science of losing touch with values, meaning, and purpose? Frankel had a psychology of that, but Frankel was not very um, interested or dogged in his pursuit of experimental evidence. And I would say the failure of the existential psychologies, which I dearly love, you know, I've got a copy of Man's Search for Meaning that, you know, the edges of the pages are, you know, worn off of it from reading. The failure of existential theory was, as I said before, it never generated a large body of experimental evidence. I want the issues that Frankl talked about, the ways that purpose and meaning can can embolden people and help them to move in their lives, I want an experimental science that includes that. The last one here um, is that people settle into patterns of impulsivity or uh, avoidant persistence. So they keep doing things over and over again, even though these things don't work, or they don't do things, and get stuck not doing things, and burrow themselves deeper and deeper down into lives. Now, you know, how do we address these things? Well, we build practices. So we have interventions and practices that help people to practice making contact with the richness of the present moment. Some of them look like mindfulness sorts of technologies. Um, uh, uh, all of them involve facilitating the sort of careful, intentional movement of awareness. We are uh, uh, on the same page uh, as a lot of the mindfulness-based therapies uh, on this, uh, in this regard. It turns out that uh, non-acceptance isn't like this sort of fixed star. People can learn to be more accepting. We have a variety of interventions and methods that people can practice uh, to increase acceptance. People can practice, practice holding lightly uh, stories that they tell themselves about the world and stories that they tell about themselves. They can learn flexible perspective taking. It isn't like this just pops up like the developmental uh, psychologists told us, you know, like you're little and you can't take perspective and then you get a little bigger and you grow the perspective taking part of your brain and now you can take the perspective of others. It turns out that perspective taking looks like it is operant behavior can be learned. You can learn to take perspective just like you can learn to hit a baseball uh, uh, or, uh, you know, do yoga or any of the other kinds of skills that you might have. Is it harder for some people than others? You bet. Um, is it broadly learnable? It seems so. Although ultimately that is an experimental question. It's not you know, do I think so? It's not just Paul thinks so. It's do, can we show it with the data? This business about values. There are interventions inside the ACT treatment protocols that ask people to actively uh, examine the patterns of their own lives and to examine ways that they would like to grow and develop those patterns in their lives. Um, many of the contemporary behavioral activation protocols are increasingly using these kinds of uh, values explorations as a way to find the kind of strongest possible reinforcers uh, uh, that can help people move ahead in their lives, identify areas of growth in their life, and also motivate the very, very hard work of psychotherapy. And the last one is that no matter what value pattern you select, um, you will find yourself in violation of that, right? If it's a very complex pattern, 
So one of my values is to be a good husband to my wife. Does that mean that I'm always a good husband to my wife? Of course not. You know, there are times when I'm cold or callous or uh, uh, thoughtless of her. You know, this part right here is a practice uh, that involves coming back uh, to that, that, the, that pattern that has been developed in the values work and act. So, for example, uh, the best way to think about this um, metaphorically, I think, is that in a breathing meditation, you bring your awareness to your breath. And if you're like me, you can sit down, and sometimes you can go as long as two breaths before you know, your awareness drifts off and you start thinking about grocery lists and who's going to pick the kids up and things like that. And so if you're doing that, then what's your job, you know, when your mind wanders? Your job is to bring your awareness back to your breath. Okay. So if you cultivate a pattern of behavior um, that is meaningful to you, and you say, okay, being a good husband looks like this, you will find yourself off of that, just like you found yourself off of your breath. Uh, and inside the ACT model, we build practices of when you find yourself off of your value, of bringing yourself uh, back into alignment with that value. Okay, so how do we evaluate theories? I've talked a bit about this before. One thing is, I think that they should be application informative. Um, I think, personally, that one of Beck's uh, most stunning and stellar uh, books is his 1987 Cognitive Therapy of Emotional Disorders. Here's why I say that is an, an extraordinary and uh, wonderful book. is because Beck says in there, this is not just some set of techniques. This is a set of principles. And if you understand these principles, uh, you will be able to devise by yourself therapeutic interventions that are uh, consistent with this set of principles. So he created a theory that was application friendly, not just like some kind of cookbook, do this, then do this, then do that. If you understand Beck's core principles, then you yourself, <coughs> confronted with the kinds of things your client believes, will be able to devise and design clinical strategies that apply to them. This was written before we went crazy with this idea that we had to, you know, follow slathering behind the DSM. Beck didn't, did. Beck didn't need a DSM to develop cognitive uh, theory, uh, his, his, his cognitive therapy theory. So they should be application informative. The model should tell you what to do, right? It should give you, and not like in a cookbook way, not in a recipe way, because everybody knows clients don't come in presenting, you know, just in a way that fits exactly with the protocol. You've got to have uh, you know, some range of flexibility, and you want that to be principle-driven. It also needs to be experimentally uh, informative. So the theory needs to tell you what to do clinically, but it also needs to be capable of generating experiments, and I would say uh, uh, including very, very basic kinds of uh, laboratory experiments, and also applied experiments. Now, there are different theories that you know, sort of rise or fall um, um, by these criteria that I'm suggesting here. Now, you, uh, you don't have to buy these criteria, but these are the ones um, that I want to use. So there are a lot of theories out there that tell you what to do clinically, but no one can figure out how to test them experimentally. I would count among those some of the humanistic uh, therapies, uh, existential psychotherapy, Gestalt has suffered uh, from this difficulty. Lots of really incredible interventions, lots of marvelous and orienting insights. I've probably never given an ACT workshop where I didn't quote Carl Rogers. Right? Uh, there's a lot in there to orient the clinician, but there's not much of anything in there to orient the scientist. And if you look at the whole body of scientific evidence in these areas, it's meager, it's small. So these are the criteria that I'm going to use. And the last one, and I think this one is critical, is broadly applicable. If you have one theory that tells you how to deal with a wide variety of problems, that is superior than multiple theories 
you know, to deal with multiple problems. Now, there is a move on right now, and of course Paul cares about this, and every serious scientist in empirical clinical psychology cares about this. Broadly applicable theories. And we're seeing some real attempts at integration. So David Barlow, uh, for example, you know, has his uh, 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 integrated protocol. Now, my concern with uh, David Barlow, and he's kind of one of my intellectual grandparents, is that it doesn't integrate enough things. It does a good job of integrating anxiety, the anxiety disorders. It does a good job, I think, of integrating anxiety and depression. But what about uh, uh, psychotic disorders? What about Asperger's? What about autism spectrum? What about, and just you know, go down the list, not of diagnoses, but of these different kinds of difficulties that people have. Now, could it be grown into a really broad, really broad diagnostic system? It's possible, and I wish him well, and no one has ever accused David Barlow of not being ambitious, uh, so I'm guessing he'll try. In fact, I would like to see uh, us abandon the DSM and the serious uh, theories that are out there in the scientific realm, uh, uh, the various different cognitive, would themselves begin to develop diagnostic uh, systems based on those theoretical principles. That almost happened uh, before we jumped uh, onto the DSM bandwagon. I'm just hoping this DSM is bad enough you know, that we finally throw it out and get back to psychology. Now this is kind of the traditional treatment development strategy um, that you often see, and it's one that's described pretty well at the National Institutes of Health. You generate a theory-based protocol, you test the treatment in small open trials, you test the treatment in small pilot randomized trials, you test the treatment in larger randomized trials, you test the treatment in multi-site trials, and then if all that goes well, then you test um, uh, uh, is this a generalizable treatment? Can we sort of take this model and apply it lots of different places? And maybe you also uh, uh, begin to test mechanisms of action. Now we're taking a different strategy um, with the psychological flexibility model. And ours has been more like this. The clarification of basic philosophical assumptions. If you're interested in that, then you can look at um, functional contextualism. It is a contemporary, contextual, pragmatic philosophy of science that uh, guides this work. I would be happy to uh, supply you with uh, readings which are understandable, I think. <laughs> the second uh, piece of work, um, and this one was really ongoing when I got to Reno uh, in the late 1980s, <coughs> Uh, is to generate uh, an initial theoretical analysis. And for us, I'm a behaviorist. My name's Kelly, and I'm a behavior analyst. That includes direct behavioral contingencies, meaning operant and respondent contingencies, relational frame theory, which we think was an important hole in Skinner's behavioral theory. We think that, in part, the cognitive revolution uh, rose up, especially in clinical, because the behavior theory guys, uh, like Skinner, did not have good answers to the question, what about cognition? We don't think Skinner's answer was good, and here's my evidence for that. Where is the experimental analysis of Skinner's evidence, or, or Skinner's theory of cognition? You know, where is that evidence base? And I can tell you, it's nowhere. Skinner's theory of cognition was a bad theory. Why was it a bad theory? Because it never generated a large body of evidence. Behavior analysts get really mad when I say that. And I say, show me the evidence. Our alternative to that, this theory of symbolic, uh, you, could, you could think of as symbolic stimulus control. Like you don't have to learn each stimulus like if it's paired with this other stimulus. In fact, there was a new piece, a brain science piece, that was just published, a relational frame theory article, that showed that you could get uh, brains lighting up in the same way with classical conditioning, 
with instruction